Okay, so I'm reading out an essay that I wrote、uh, for college. This is entitled "Crash Landing on Job." <laughs> okay.、Um, let's see.、Uh, "Crash Landing on Job." Uh, I did not cry at my mother's funeral, but I confess I broke down watching the finale of Crash Landing on You. The purpose of this essay is to demonstrate how Job is God's K drama for the soul. Only by gazing at another's pain can we receive comfort and rest from our own. Three perspectives on suffering: God, Job's friends, and finally Job himself. Number one, God. Sometimes the wrong train takes you to the right direction. Life is hard, unless you're stupid or God, <laughs> who for the most part appears detached from the harsh realities of human suffering. Even when handing the Xbox controller of Job's life over to Satan, no less, the Almighty drops a cheat code in the final moments, wasting his opponent in a raw smackdown of total awesomeness. While suffering poses no existential challenge for God, it certainly does for atheist Stephen Fry. How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that it's not our fault? It's not right.、Uh, Fry's vicious indictment against his maker virtually echoes Job's: "The earth is given into the hand of the wicked; he covers the faces of his judges. If it is not he, who then is it?" Such is the problem of. The Odyssey, the question of God's honor in the face of suffering, articulated from our puny human perspective, not so from the heavenly perspective, or dare I say, the demonic. Does Job fear God for no reason? It is not affliction, but rather an overabundance in blessing that besmirches God's five-star rating on Job's grab profile, according to Satan, who accuses the Lord of overprotectiveness. Of overblessing Job, the opening verses to the book read like an asset declaration rivaling the wealthiest MPs from Pakatan, thus proposing the counterweight, suffering. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. All of Job's earthly possessions are either stolen or wiped out quicker than you can say Bitcoin. His ten kids perish in a freak meteorological accident. Sores invade his body from head to toe, and his own wife urges him to curse God and die. Obviously, she wasn't invited to the recent negotiations at Three Pacific Hotel. He does not, however, at least not initially. Though overwhelmingly intense and seemingly unexplainable, Job's suffering fails to diminish his devotion. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? The condition of Job's fidelity is dependent not on circumstance but character, Job's, but equally so God's. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Notice how the author declares Job's blamelessness. Job sinned not, as Job himself indicates God's righteousness. The Lord has wronged no one. Far from disproving God's goodness, it would seem that suffering has the opposite endpoint. Here, in vindicating God's boast over Job's blamelessness, greater still on the cross, where Jesus's death and resurrection justifies God's declaration of our forensic righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. No longer. Is God detached from our suffering? For in Christ, He takes it upon Himself, becoming like us in our weakness and temptation. The implication being that we, in turn, should no longer distance ourselves from His throne of grace in our time of need. Number two, Job's buddies. The world isn't a flower field. You shouldn't be good to people who beat you up. Those who throw punches. Don't know how much it hurts. Only those who take punches do. Joe compares the verbal trolling of his frenemies to melting ice in a hot desert, having the appearance of a refreshment to the weary traveler, only to lure unsuspecting caravans towards a disappointing and untimely demise. Not unlike the 1996 Pepsi commercial promising an Aviate Harrier II fighter jet. 
in exchange for 7, 7 million Pepsi points, which 23-year-old John Leonard unsuccessfully attempted to redeem, thankfully without needing to drink 7 million bottles of soda. Billy, Elliot, and Zorro began sincerely squatting seven days alongside Job as mourners and silent companions. As Job bemoans his condition, however, cursing his existence, questioning God's objectivity, while maintaining his own innocence in the face of excessive divine punishment, the trio are forced into the position of defending God's honor by tearing down their grieving friend, genuinely believing that they're doing God a solid. I suspect one of the great challenges preaching through these chapters on Sunday lies in the fact that without deliberate commentary and disclaimer, many a Christian might find themselves nodding in agreement with our three conservative, almost evangelical theologians. Suppose chapter 42 were ripped out, for instance, uh, removing all evidence of God's rebuke against Eliphaz and his friends for not speaking what is right as my servant Job has. This particular SBTC essay question may well have been retitled, Explore the Virtues of Discipline in the Church and the Dangers Maligning God in Our Fits of Uncontrollable Anger, as outlined in the book of Eliphaz. To be fair, Eliphaz begins with a soft touch, albeit laced with sarcasm. If one ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? Behold, you've instructed many, but now it has come to you and you are impatient. It touches you and you are dismayed. Or as Uncle Roger would say, Hiya, so weak, so weak. <laughs> At this early stage, Eliphaz still fancies himself as Job's superior. Now a word was brought to me stealthily. My ear received the whisper of it. Can mortal man be in the right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? A mysterious encounter imbues Eliphaz's words with supernatural authority. God gave me this prophecy, Job. You are not as innocent as you think. It is possible Eliphaz made the whole thing up, especially when he's called out for misrepresenting God in the concluding chapter. Yet it is interesting how Job parrots Eliphaz's words back to Bildad when he says, Truly I know it is so, but how can a man be right before God? Pitting his friend's logic against each other. Eliphaz says no one is blameless before God. Well, Bildad had just argued that God never rejects a blameless person. Which is it, fellas? Make up your mind, bro. Three observations from this exchange. Firstly, there are traces of truth in all of their teaching. Joe validates both arguments. Perhaps God did send you that spooky DM after all, Eliphaz. I'm with you 100%, Bildad. Secondly, theirs is a misapplied truth, hence the inconsistencies in their logic. Yes, God indeed commends the blameless, as he did with Job in the past, except God also allows the blameless to suffer innocently, as experienced by Job in the present. Finally, truth without love is counsel without comfort. I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. I don't know about you, but that last accusation about being a lousy friend, it cuts deep into my heart, deeper still than God's critique of for preaching a wonky sermon on suffering. It reminds me of Peter, James, and John betraying Jesus' trust oblivious to his suffering at Gethsemane. It reminds me of my own self-centeredness in reading this book, writing this essay just to pass this module. If there is one lesson I need to take away from this book, it is this. I am a miserable comforter. 
Thankfully, there is atonement for the most miserable of comforters. Go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. More humbling than Zahid, courting support from Anwar, and more humiliating than Dwayne Johnson making another Fast and Furious movie with Vin Diesel. Billy, Elliot, and Zorro have no choice but to turn back to Job. But therein lies the gospel of Job. It is the way back to God. The one we rejected prays for our acceptance. The one we despised draws us back into his love. But before that can happen, Job needs to find his way back to God. Number three, if you give up on waiting, the pain of loss will kill you. That's why you have to wait. The bittersweet sweet ending to Captain Ree and Ceres, whirlwind romance in the 2019 Netflix K-drama Crash Landing on You, saw the couple separated at gunpoint at the North South Korean military border, seemingly for good. Three years go by, and the scene shifts to the mountainous slopes of Switzerland, where Seri has set up a charity for underprivileged children appointing Captain Rhee as its director, thus making it possible for two weeks in a year for our lovebirds to share a Toblerone together. Incidentally, the two actors tied the knot for real and are expecting their first child this December. It is easy to be cynical of fairy tale endings, poking fun at kimchi heads like me. But how different is Job's story, really? And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. God numerically doubles all of Job's assets from before. 7K baas, 3K humps, 500 mumus, and 500 mhos. He even gets another 10 kids. Not sure how his, wealth, his wife felt about that. Seriously, she should get an award. It's the perfect fairy tale ending if there ever was one. Try telling that to a grieving parent, a cancer patient, the friend who got fired from his job. God's going to double your blessing at the end. Doesn't quite work does it? At least when Job was covered in sores, or when his friends called him a non-Christian, or when he was releasing all that rage accusing God of being a bully, at least those moments felt cathartic, familiar, or even helpful. But how is this supposed to help? Then again, doesn't Jesus make a similar promise to his disciples? Peter asks him, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus answers, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Jesus is outrageous compared to Job. 100 full blessings, that's super scammy. Then again, Jesus is talking about a coming glory, a new world, a life that is eternal. In other words, what God has in store for our suffering is not merely an end, but a new beginning. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on a throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Such is the glory of the new heavens and earth, with all its promise of life and blessing and joy, that God measures all that fullness against all our tears, 
against all our pain, all our loss that we experience in this life of bitterness and pain. As if to say to us Christians, it will be worth it. Just you wait. Just you wait. Amidst all his pain and angst, there was one thing Job never stopped doing, and that was waiting. Waiting for God to respond. Uh, more than any blessing or reversal of fortune, it was God's presence alone that Job longed for, finally received, and found true comfort in. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, and now my eye sees you, therefore I despise myself, and repent, or am comforted, in dust and ashes. Conclusion Three things we've seen in Job's suffering. God is proved right in his suffering. His friends are forgiven for his suffering. Finally, Job, Job is restored at the end of his suffering, but more so at the end of his waiting. This is Revelation 22.20. He who testifies to these things say, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Or... Maranatha.